Hi, welcome. This is Kathleen, and today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite all-time historical true crime cases, the Lizzie Borden case. And the first thing I'm going to do is read the Wikipedia page, or most of it, because it has a lot of information that people may not know about the Lizzie Borden case. If you think you know all about the case, you probably don't, depending on if you're really into true crime and you've researched this case or if you just like read like one or two books about it because you know always remember authors or even newspaper writers and stuff like that can have their own theory or opinion that may not line up with yours or with the evidence and also a lot of authors write books and sensationalize them to you know get sales because if you write a book, obviously you want it to sell, so they may, you know, put in information or, you know, make up some kind of new information to get people interested in their books, but it may not be based on any truth or evidence. So the first thing I'm going to do is read the Wikipedia page, and also, just like with anything else, the Wikipedia page may have inaccurate or wrong information. But I think most of it is correct, so I am going to read a lot of what's on the Wikipedia page so that people have background information on the case in case they don't know specific details about this case already. The Wikipedia page about Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Andrew Borden, that was her full name, was born July 19, 1860 to, and died on June 1, 1927. She was an American woman tried and acquitted of the August 4, 1892 axe murders of her father and stepmother in Fall River, Massachusetts. No one else was charged in the murders, and despite ostracism from other residents, Borden spent the remainder of her life in Fall River. She died of pneumonia at age 66, just days before the death of her older sister, Emma. The Borden murders and trial received widespread publicity throughout the United States in a long, with Borden herself, they remain a topic in American popular culture to the present day. They have been depicted in numerous films, theatrical productions, literary works, and folk rhymes, and are still very well known in the Fall River area. Lizzie Andrew Borden was born July 19, 1860 in Fall River, Massachusetts to Sarah Anthony Borden and Andrew Jackson Borden. Her father, who was of English and Welsh descent, grew up in very modest surroundings and struggled financially as a young man, despite being the descendant of wealthy and influential local residents. Andrew eventually prospered in the manufacture and sale of furniture and caskets, then became a successful property developer. He was a director of several textile mills and owned considerable com commercial property. He was also president of the Union Savings Bank and a director of the Durfee Safe Deposit and Trust Company. At his death, his estate was valued at $300,000, which, a note here, um, in today's money, that would be equivalent to $9 million, or over $9 million, so that was a lot of money back then. So he was quite wealthy. Despite his wealth, Andrew was known for his frugality. For instance, the Borden home lacked indoor plumbing, although at the time it was a common accommodation for the wealthy. It was in an affluent area, but the wealthiest residents of Fall River, including Andrew's cousins, generally lived in the more fashionable neighborhood, The Hill, which was um, further from the industrial areas of the city. Borden and her older sister, Emma Lenora Borden, had a relatively religious upbringing and attended Central Congregational Church. As a young woman, Lizzie was very involved in church activities, including teaching Sunday school to children of recent immigrants to the United States. She was involved in religious organizations such as the Christian Endeavor Society, for which she served as secretary treasurer, and contemporary social movements such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She was also a member of the Ladies Fruit and Flower Mission. Three years after the death of Lizzie's mother, Cicera, Andrew married Abby Durfee Gray. Lizzie stated that she called her stepmother Mrs. Borden and demurred on whether they had a cordial relationship. 
she believed that Abby had married her father for his wealth. Bridget Sullivan, whom they called Maggie, the Borden's 25-year-old living maid, who had immigrated to the U U.S. from Ireland, testified that Lizzie and Emma rarely ate meals with their parents. In May 1892, Andrew killed multiple pigeons in his barn with a hatchet, believing they were attracting local children to hunt them. Lizzie had recently built a roost for the pigeons, and it has been commonly recounted that she was upset over his killing of them, though the veracity of this has been disputed. A family argument in July 1892 prompted both sisters to take extended vacations in New Bedford. After returning to Fall River a week before the murders, Lizzie chose to stay in a local rooming house for, the, for four days before returning to the family residence. Tension had been growing within the Borden family in the months before the murders, especially over Andrew's gifts of real estate to various branches of Abby's family. After their stepmother's sister received a house, the sisters demanded and received a rental property, the home they had lived in until their mother died, which they purchased from their father for one dollar. A few weeks before the murders, they sold the property back to their father for five thousand dollars, which back then that would be equivalent to approximately a hundred fifty thousand dollars. The night before the murders, John Vinicum Morse, the brother of Lizzie and Emma's deceased mother, visited and was invited to stay for a few days to discuss business matters with his brother-in-law Andrew. Some writers who have speculated that their conversation, particularly about property transfer, may have aggravated an already tense situation. For several days before the murders, the entire household had been violently ill. A family friend later speculated that mutton left on the stove to use in meals over several days was the cause, but Abby had feared poison given that Andrew had not been a popular man. Murders, August 4, 1892. John Morse arrived in the evening of August 3rd and slept in the guest room that night. After breakfast the next morning, at which Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, John, and the Bordens made Bridget Maggie Sullivan were present, Andrew and John went to the sitting room, where they chatted for nearly an hour. Morse left around 8.48 a.m. to buy a pair of oxen and visit his niece in Fall River, planning to return to the Borden home for lunch at noon. Andrew left for his morning walk sometime after 9 a.m. So according to the Wikipedia page, if the information is correct on this page, Andrew and Abby, Lizzie Borden, and John, the uncle of Lizzie Borden, the brother of her deceased mother, and the maid Maggie all ate together that morning, ate breakfast together that morning. And although the cleaning of the guest room was one of Lizzie and Emma's regular chores, Abby went upstairs sometime between 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. to make the bed. According to the forensic investigation, Abby was facing her killer at the time of the attack. She was first struck on the side of the head with a hatchet which cut her just above the ear, causing her to turn and fall face down on the floor, creating contusions on her nose and forehead. Her killer then struck her multiple times, delivering 17 more direct hits to the back of her head, killing her. When Andrew returned at around 10.30 a.m., his key failed to open the door, so he knocked. Sullivan went to unlock the door, finding it jammed. She uttered a curse. Remember, Sullivan is the maid Maggie. Maggie would later testify that she heard Lizzie laughing immediately after this. She did not see Lizzie, but stated that the laughter was coming from the top of the stairs. This was considered significant as Abby was already dead by this time, and her body would have been visible to anyone on the home's second floor. So, in other words, if Lizzie had been standing at the top of the stairs, she would have seen Abby's body. There's no way she could have not have seen it. 
Lizzie later denied being upstairs and testified that her father had asked her where Abby was, to which she replied that a messenger had delivered Abby a summons to visit a sick friend. Lizzie stated that she had then removed Andrew's boots and helped him into his slippers before he lay down on the sofa for a nap, a detail contradicted by the crime scene photos, which show Andrew wearing boots. She then informed Sullivan of a department store sale and offered her permission to attend, but Su Sullivan felt unwell and went to take a nap in her bedroom instead. Sullivan testified that she was in her third floor room, resting from cleaning windows, when just before 11.10 a.m., she heard Lizzie call from downstairs, Maggie, come quick, father's dead. Somebody came in and killed him. Andrew was slumped on a couch in the downstairs sitting room, struck 10 or 11 times with a hatchet-like weapon. One of his eyes had been split cleanly in two, suggesting that he had been asleep when attacked. His still bleeding wound suggested a very recent attack. Dr. Bowen, the family's physician, arrived from his home across the street and pronounced both victims dead. Detectives estimated that Andrew's death had occurred at approximately 11 a.m. Investigation Lizzie Borden's initial answers to the police officer's questions were at times strange and contradictory. Initially, she reported hearing a groan or a scraping noise or a distress call before entering the house. Two hours later, she told police she had heard nothing and entered the house not realizing that anything was wrong. When asked where her stepmother was, she recounted Abby receiving a note asking her to visit a sick friend. She also stated that she thought Abby had returned and asked if someone could go upstairs and look for her. Sullivan, remember Sullivan's the maid Maggie, and a neighbor, Mrs. Churchill, were halfway up the stairs, their eyes level with the floor when they looked into the guest room and saw Abby lying face down on the floor. So the neighbor and the maid, just being halfway up the stairs, were able to see Abby laying on the floor. So if it's true that um, Lizzie was standing at the top of the stairs earlier, she definitely would have seen Abby laying there dead. Most of the officers who interviewed Borden reported that they disliked her attitude. And, of course, you know, not liking her attitude doesn't mean she's guilty, but I think what that's referring to is that she didn't act in a way that somebody would had they just found their parents hacked to death. So they, they thought her behavior was odd and strange that day. Some said she was too calm and poised. Despite her attitude and changing alibis, nobody bothered to check her for blood stains. And this was a problem because back then, women went, weren't looked at as criminals as much as men were. They weren't looked as capable of being murderers. And also, just because back then the respect, you know, they had for the different sexes, you know, men wouldn't... You know, most of the, or all of the police officers were men, so they weren't going to ask her to, you know, lift up her dress or, you know, show them her legs or, you know, check her clothing or her body for blood stains and, and stuff like that. So it's a different time. So remember, it's not like it is today where, you know, they take you in, they take pictures, they check your fingernails, they get DNA samples and all that. This was in the late 1800s. So police did search her room, but it was a cursory inspection. In other words, meaning they didn't do a deep dive into her room. They didn't look in every place that something could have been hidden, like a dress with blood on it, or a handle to an axe, or a whole axe, or hatchet with blood on it, and things like that. At the trial, they admitted to not doing a proper search because Borden was not feeling well. So apparently also on the day that I was questioning her, the day of the murders, um, she told them she wasn't feeling well. And obviously they had sympathy for her because one, she was a female, two, she said she wasn't feeling well, and three, her parents were just murdered. So, you know, I guess, you know, they didn't really, you know, go after her like they would somebody today and take them in for questioning, some hard questioning. Um, they were subsequently criticized for their lack of diligence. In the basement, police found two hatchets, two axes, 
and a hatchet head with a broken handle. So hatchets are like, you know, like smaller axes with or shorter handles, and then the axe, and to my thinking, in my opinion, the axe would be the long, like you know, regular axe. But hatchets are smaller and have smaller handles. And so they say a, a hatchet head with a broken handle was found. So the hatchet head was suspected of being the murder weapon as the break in the handle appeared fresh. And the ash and dust on the head, unlike that on the other bladed tools, appeared to have been deliberately applied to make it look as if it had been in the basement for some time. So in other words, <laughs> the hatchet head that had the missing or broken handle didn't look like the other hatchets and axes down there, it looked like it had been, you know, like somebody purposely had covered it with ash and dust to try to make it look like the others, according to the police. However, none of these tools were removed from the house. Again, remember it's late 1800s, she's a woman and, you know, just things were different back then. They did not even remove, remove the tools at that time to do anything with them. And I guess back then, you know, that there wasn't a lot they could do with them, but if they thought they might be a murder weapon, they should have confiscated them, but, you know. Because of the mysterious illness that had stricken the household before the murders, the family's milk and Andrew's and Abby's stomachs, removed during autopsies performed in the board and dining room, were tested for poison. So the police were informed that you know the family had been sick the days prior to their murder. And so they took the milk and they tested their stomachs, their actual internal organ stomachs were removed in the home because that's just how it worked back then. They didn't take them to a, like a morgue or somewhere to do an autopsy. And they Autopsies were performed in the dining room, right there on the table, and they removed their stomachs and were tested for poison. And I don't know what kind of tests they had back then, but they're probably, obviously, not as good as the tests we have today to check for poison. But back then, apparently, no poison was found. So residents suspected Lizzie of purchasing hydrocyanic acid in a diluted form from the local drugstore. And that hydrocyanic acid acid is also called, I think, Prusik acid, Prusik, I believe, and um, she defended that she had inquired about the acid so she could clean her furs, despite the local medical examiner's testimony that it did not have antiseptic properties. So just a day prior to their murders, Lizzie had tried to purchase poison from the local drugstore. Lizzie and Emma's friend, Alice Russell, decided to stay with them the night following the murders, while Morse, remember that's her uncle, spent the night in the attic guest room, contrary to later accounts that he slept in the murder site guest room. Police were stationed around the house on the night of August 4th, during which an officer said he had seen Borden enter the cellar with Russell. So apparently Lizzie Borden and Alice Russell went into the cellar carrying a kerosene lamp and a slop pail. He stated he saw both women exit the cellar after which Borden returned alone. So after both of them entered and exited, apparently Borden came back alone. Though he was unable to see what she was doing, he stated it appeared she was bent over the sink. So apparently he thinks he saw her bent over the sink in the cellar. On August 5th, Morse left the house and was mobbed by hundreds of people. Police had to escort him back to the house. On August 6th, police conducted a more thorough search of the house, inspecting the sisters' clothing and confiscating the broken hand handled hatchet. So it was, wasn't until August 6th that they actually did a more thorough search of the house, inspecting the sisters' clothing and confiscating the broken handled hatchet hatchet head. So that was two days. Remember, two days later. So, inquest. Borden appeared at the inquest hearing on August 8th. 
Her request to have her family attorney present was refused under a state statute providing that an inquest must be held in private. She had been prescribed regular doses of morphine to calm her nerves, and it is possible that her testimony was affected by this. Her behavior was erratic, and she often refused to answer a question, even if the answer would be beneficial to her. She often contradicted herself and provided alternating accounts of the morning in question, such as saying she was in the kitchen reading a magazine when her father arrived home, then saying she was in the dining room doing some ironing, and then saying she was coming down the stairs. She also said she removed her father's boots and put slippers on him, while police photographs clearly showed him still wearing his boots. So if she took his boots off, did the murderer, if it wasn't her, put them back on after he died? Or did she remember that she had taken them off but forgot that after she killed him, she put them back on? Did the boots have blood on them? I mean, you know, just, that's a pretty big flaw in her testimony that she says that she put his slippers on his feet but yet in his death photos he's wearing his boots. The district attorney was very aggressive and confrontational. On August 11th, Borden was served with a warrant of arrest and jailed. The inquest testimony, the basis for the modern debate regarding her guilt or innocence, was later ruled inadmissible at her trial in June of 1893. So none of that stuff from the inquest was allowed at her trial. Contemporaneous newspaper articles noted that Borden possessed a stolid demeanor and bit her lips, flushed and bent toward attorney Adams. It was also reported that the testimony provided in the inquest had caused a change of opinion among her friends who have heretofore strongly maintained her innocence. The inquest received significant press attention nationwide, including an extensive three-page write-up in the Boston Globe. A grand jury began hearing evidence on November 7th and Borden was indicted on December 2nd. Trial and acquittal. Borden's trial took place in New Bedford starting on June 5th, 1893. Prosecuting attorneys were Hosea Knowlton and future United States Supreme Court Justice William H. Moody. Defending were Andrew V. Jennings, Melvin O. Adams, and former Massachusetts Governor George D. Robinson. Five days before the trial's commencement on June 1st, another axe murder occurred in Fall River. This time the victim was Bertha Manchester, who was found hacked to death in her kitchen. The similarities between the Manchester and Borden's murders were striking and noted by jurors. However, Jose Carrera de Melio, I know I pronounced that wrong, a Portuguese immigrant was later convicted of Manchester's murder in 1894 and was determined not to have been in the vicinity of Fall River at the time of the Borden murders. A prominent point of discussion in the trial or press coverage of it was the hatchet head found in the basement which was not convincingly demonstrated by the prosecution to be the murder weapon. Prosecutors argued that the killer had removed the handle because it would have been covered in blood, which could make sense, but where did the handle go and why, why didn't she just leave the, had the hatchet, the head, where she hid the handle? One officer testified that a hatchet handle was found near the hatchet head, but another officer contradicted this. So, you know, the investigator, investigating officers or the officers who were there gave contradicting evidence. So that's not good for the prosecution. Though no bloody clothing was found at the scene, Russell testified that on August 8, 1892, she had witnessed Borden burn a dress in the kitchen stove, saying it had been ruined when she brushed against wet paint. During the course of the trial, defense never attempted to challenge this statement. So the defense never bothered to challenge the fact that Alice Russell had seen her burn the dress in the stove. And so that makes me tend to think that they didn't have anything to contradict that and Lucy maybe didn't want to call her friend a liar. So they just, you know, left it be and let people think that it was just a dress that had paint on it that she burned and it wasn't a big deal. 
Lizzie Borden's presence at the home was also a point of dispute during the trial, according to testimony. Sullivan entered the second floor of the home at around 10.58 a.m. and left Lizzie and her father downstairs. Lizzie told several people that at this time she went into the barn and was not in the house for 20 minutes or possibly a half an hour. Hyman Lebinsky testified for the defense that he saw Lizzie Borden leaving the barn at 11.03 a.m. and Charles Gardner confirmed the time. At 11.10 a.m., Lizzie called Sullivan downstairs, told her Andrew had been murdered, and ordered her not to enter the room. Instead, Borden sent her to get a doctor. Both victims' heads had been removed during autopsy, and the skulls were admitted as evidence during the trial and presented on June 5, 1893. Upon seeing them in the courtroom, Borden fainted. Evidence was excluded that Borden had sought to purchase Prusik acid hydrogen cyanide purportedly for cleaning a sealskin cloak from a local druggist on the day before the murders. The judge ruled that the incident was too remote in time to have any connection. The presiding associate justice, Justin Dewey, who had been appointed by Robinson when he was governor, delivered a lengthy summary that supported the defense as his charge to the jury before it was sent to deliberate on June 20th, 1893. After an hour and a half of deliberation, the jury acquitted Borden of the murders. Upon exiting the courthouse, she told reporters she was the happiest woman in the world. The trial has been compared to the later trials of Bruno Hauptmann, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and O.J. Simpson as a landmark in publicity and public interest in the history of American legal proceedings. Although acquitted at trial, Borden remains the prime suspect in her father's and stepmother's murders. Writer Victoria Lincoln proposed in 1967 that Borden might have committed the murders while in a fugate state. Another prominent suggestion was that she was physically and sexually abused by her father, which drove her to kill him. There is little evidence to support this, but incest is not a topic that would have been discussed at the time, and the methods for collecting physical evidence would have been quite different in 1892. This belief was intimated in local papers at the time of the murders and was revisited by scholar Marcia Carlisle in a 1992 essay. Mystery author Ed McBain, in his 1984 novel Lizzie, suggested that Borden committed the murders after being caught in a tryst with Sullivan. McBain elaborated on his speculation in a 1999 interview, speculating that Abby had caught Lizzie and Sullivan together and had reacted with horror and disgust and that Lizzie had killed Abby with a candlestick. When Andrew returned, she had confessed to him, but killed him in a rage with a hatchet when the when he reacted exactly as Abby had. McBain further speculates that Sullivan disposed of the hatchet somewhere afterwards. In her later years, Borden was rumored to be gay, but there was no such spe speculation about Sullivan, who found other employment after the murders and later married a man she met while working as a maid in Butte, Montana. She died in Butte in 1948, where she allegedly gave a deathbed confession to her sister, stating that she had changed her testimony on the stand in order to protect Borden. Another significant suspect is John Morse, Lizzie's maternal uncle, who rarely met with the family after his sister died, but had slept in the house the night before the murders, according to law enforcement. Morse had provided an absurdly perfect and over-detailed alibi for the death of Abby Borden. He was considered a suspect by police for a period. Others noted as potential suspects in the crimes include Sullivan, possibly in retaliation for being ordered to clean the windows on a hot day. The day of the murders was unusually hot and at the time she was still recovering from the mystery illness that had struck the household. Now, I don't think she, the maid went crazy and murdered her employers with hatchets over that. Now, did she help Lizzie after the murders? I, I think possibly so because she probably seen things around the house or helped, you know, Lizzie told her to do things and she followed orders. 
but I don't think the maid went crazy and killed them and 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 nobody witnessed it or saw it or and she she didn't have blood on her and all that I don't think she was that cunning and or frankly psychopathic to do that a man named William Borden suspected to be Andrew's illegitimate son was noted as a possible suspect by writer Arnold Arnold Brown who's prom who excuse me who surmised in his book Lizzie Borden the legend the truth the final chapter that William had tried and failed to extort money from his father however Arthur Leonard Rebello did extensive research on William Borden in Brown's book and was able to prove he was not Andrew Borden's son so that's just another you know made-up story to sell books possibly or you know uh, you know maybe the author wanted to believe it was true that William Borden was Andrew's illegitimate son but another Arthur researched it and determined that William Borden could not be his son. So although Emma had an alibi at Fairhaven, about 15 miles, 24 kilometers from Fall River, crime writer Frank Spearing proposed in his 1984 book, Lizzie, that she might have secretly visited the residence to kill her parents before returning to Fairhaven to receive the telegram informing her of the murders. So another theory by another author is that Emma actually did the murders, um, but she had the perfect alibi, alibi of being away. So she was really away, but she snuck back, committed the murders, and then snuck back to where she was staying to get the telegram that her parents had been murdered. So that's another proposed theory by another author later life. After the trial, the Borden sisters moved into a large modern house in the Hill neighborhood in Fall River. So they, the sisters finally got what they wanted, a house in Fall, the um, Hill section of Fall River, the, the nicer upscale area. Around this time, Lizzie began using the name Lizbeth A. Borden. So she went from Lizzie A. Borden to Lizbeth A. Borden. At their new house, which Lizbeth dubbed Maplecroft, they had a staff that included live-in maids, a housekeeper, and a coachman. Because Abby was ruled to have died before Andrew, her estate went first to Andrew and then, at his death, passed to his daughter as part of his estate. So can you imagine, so your father, stepfather, a stepmother get murdered, and your stepmother is killed before the father, so her family died you know, potentially gets basically screwed out of their inheritance because she was murdered first and her husband was still alive, so even though he was murdered not long after, he inherited it. So then his kids get the inheritance rather than her kids, you know, her inheritance, whatever she had. But apparently the stepmother Abby's family fought against that And so a considerable settle settlement, however, was paid to settle claims by Abby's family. So her family did fight against the Borden girls to get what was theirs from their mother's estate. Despite the acquittal, Borden was ostracized by Fall River Society. Her name was again brought into the public eye when she was accused of shoplifting in 1897 in Providence, Rhode Island. So for some reason, apparently, in Providence, Rhode Island, she shoplifted or was accused of shoplifting. And if that's true, that would show that, you know, she has, you know, a lack of ethics and integrity. And to my mind, it could, you know, signal, like one of my theories about her is that, you know, the reason she was able to kill her parents if she did was that she, because she was a psychopath that she didn't have feelings of empathy and sympathy and so if it's true that when Maggie was like trying to let her father in the door and that she heard somebody laugh and it was Lizzie that Lizzie had already killed the stepmother at the top of the stairs and she was laughing because she had jammed the door on purpose or did something to it so nobody could come in while she was doing what she was doing to the stepmother or something like that so it just 
a lot of Lizzie's behavior to me seems like she could possibly have been a psychopath or, you know, somebody, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but I use the word psychopath, meaning like somebody, you know, mean enough or evil enough to, to commit the murders in that way. So they were ostracized by Fall River Society. And in 1905, shortly after an argument over a party that Lizbeth had given for an actress, Nancy O'Neill, Liz, Lizbeth, or Lizzie, became friends with an actress named Nancy O'Neill. And she, you know, Lizbeth became like a party girl. She would have parties at her new mansion. And um, her friends were those who were probably, I don't know what the word, like, back then would be seen as party people or you know, different kind of people not the proper conservative type people that her sister maybe was used to hanging around with so Emma moved out of the house and never saw her death Borden was ill in her last year following the removal of her gallbladder. She died of pneumonia in, on June 1, 1927 in Fall River. Funeral details were not published and few attended. Nine days later, Emma died from chronic nephritis at the age of 76 in a nursing home in Newmarket, New Hampshire. Having moved to this location in 1923, both for health reasons and to avoid renewed attention following the publication of another book, book about the murders. The sisters, neither of whom had ever married, were buried side by side in the family plot in Oak Grove Cemetery. At the time of her death, Borden was worth over $250,000, which would be like over $5 million in today's time. She owned a house on the corner of French Street and Belmont Street, several office buildings, shares in several utilities, two cars, and a large amount of jewelry. She left $30,000, equivalent to over $600,000 in today's time, to the Fall River Animal Rescue League, and $500, which would be like $10,000 in today's time, in trust for perpetual care of her father's grave. So she left money for her father's grave to be cared for, but obviously not her stepmother. <laughs> her closest friend and a cousin each received $6,000, which would be like $126,000 today, substantial sums at the time of the estate's distribution in 1927. And numerous friends and family members each received between $1,000 and $5,000, which was you know, it, like a thousand would be like twenty-one thousand dollars, and five thousand would be like a hundred five thousand dollars in today's money. In culture, scholar Anne Schofield notes that Borden's story has tended to take one or the other of two fictional forms: the tragic romance and the feminist quest. As the story of Lizzie Borden has been created and recreated through many or excuse me, recreated through crime and fiction, it has taken on the qualities of a popular American myth or legend that effectively links the present to the past. The Borden House is now a museum and operates a bed and breakfast with 1890s styling. Pieces of evidence used in the trial, including the axe head, are preserved at the Fall River Historical Society. So I want to go there one day. <laughs> To the Fall River Historical Society and to the um, house, which is a bed and breakfast now. Folk rhyme. The case was memorialized in a popular skipping rope rhyme sung to the tune of the then popular song Ta Ra Ra Boom Dae. I think that's how you say that. <laughs> anyway, you know the rhyme. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Folklore says that the rhyme was made up by an anonymous writer as a tune to sell newspapers. Others attribute it to the ubiquitous but anonymous Mother Goose. In reality, Borden's stepmother suffered 18 or 19 blows and her father suffered 11 blows. So even though the rhyme says 40 and 41, it was actually the stepmother 
had more. She had 18 or 19, and the father had 11. The rhyme has a less well-known second verse, and the second verse is, Andrew Borden now is dead. Lizzie hit him on the head. Up in heaven he will sing. On the gallows, gallows she will swing. And obviously, she was found not guilty, so she didn't swing on the gallows. And then the Wikipedia page goes on to talk about the depictions of this story and all the book forums and movie forums and Broadway and musicals and songs and, and television and stuff like that. So I'm not going to read that, but it's on the Wikipedia page online if you want to read all that. So it has all that and then the literature and all the books that's been written about it and mentioned.